few things to remember. Without the highest view of Scripture, inspiration, inerrancy, historicity, there is no reason to believe Jesus was God incarnate. I mean, arguing about the deity of Christ, if you don't believe that God has spoken with clarity in the Bible, it's just foolishness. I mean, it's just myth versus myth. Uh, I, why would anyone bother? That's why liberal theologians always abandon these things, because they no longer believe that God has actually spoken. Number two, without sola scriptura, scripture alone, and tota scriptura, all of scripture, one will never believe in the deity of Christ. In other words, if you're willing to pick and choose, I like this text, I don't like this text, don't care about that text, I like this text. As long as you're willing to pick and choose, you can come up with any Christ you want. You can focus upon the text to talk about Jesus' subordination to the Father and his humiliation and so on and so forth. That, that's easy. Uh, you have to believe in sola scriptura and tota scriptura. And finally, all of what the Bible says about Christ must be taken into consideration. Christians often get stuck in proof texting instead of asking the opponent of orthodoxy to give the same kind of evidence for their own position. Any passage can be taken in exclusion of others to the detriment of the truth. And so when you're in the midst of a battle, I, I met with a Jehovah's Witness about, I don't know, about four or five months ago, and uh, we had a three, three and a half hour conversation. And in the midst of that back and forth. It's very easy to develop tunnel vision. You want to get to a particular point. You want to communicate a particular thing. But you always have to keep in mind that when you're looking at a text, they will always have you on the defensive. You explain this to me. You have to put the shoe on the other foot. You explain to me how Michael the archangel can be described in these words. Don't let them always have you on the defensive. You have to be asking them, you tell me, you're telling me Jesus is Michael the Archangel? You're telling me that we're to be baptized in the name of the Father, Michael the Archangel, in an impersonal act of force, right? Make them put their position into all those texts, too. Very, very important, okay? Now, three categories of evidence for the deity of Christ. The use of God in describing Christ, he is called God numerous times in the Bible. But especially with Jehovah's Witnesses, that's not where I go first. Because they want to argue about gods and a God and Moses was a God to Pharaoh and blah, 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 blah. I go to the second, the identification of Jesus as Yahweh. Because especially for a Jehovah's Witness, if Jesus is actually identified as Yahweh, the argument is over. All the stuff about a God, God, is irrelevant. If Jesus is Yahweh, Jesus is God, period, end of discussion. That's very, very strong. And finally, the ascription of divine attributes and activities to Christ is the third category of evidence. Now, here's a list. I normally would stop here and go through each one. Don't have the time. Probably couldn't stand that long either. Uh, where Jesus is identified as God, the os. Uh, I've got entire slides and everything on each one of them, and we could go through them, and they're all exciting and thrilling and so on and so forth. But I want to focus upon that second category because I have seen so many Christians use this to their advantage in conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses, and that is the identification of Jesus as Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. And I only suggest using two texts. There are many that teach this, but there are two texts, and what I'll do is I'll present them to you in such a way as you would want to present them to a Jehovah's Witness, then I will say, thank you for being here this evening. We'll pray and we'll go home. That hopefully will keep you awake enough, long enough to get through it. Here's what I would do. And uh, be prepared for feedback. I'm walking to the front aisle. <clears throat> Bibles always help. I would use their Bible. Go ahead and use our New World Translation. It's not going to bother you here. And I would say, would you read me a text about Jehovah from the Psalms? Okay, sure. Well, Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. All right. And I'd turn there with him. And could you read these verses for me? All right. Well, it says, uh, now this is New American Standard. This is an NWT. But as of old you found the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you're the same, and your years will not come to an end. I so said, now, who's this about? At the beginning of Psalm 102, can you tell me who this is about? Well, it says, hear my prayer, O Jehovah. 
And in their Bible, it will say Jehovah. Okay. And uh, if you just look, for example, uh, <coughs> verse 21, that men may tell the name of Jehovah in Zion. So this, is, this is about Jehovah, right? Right. Okay. And it's saying that Jehovah is immutable, unchangeable, right? It's, it's talking about how he founded the earth. Uh, they will perish, but you endure. All of them will wear out like a garment. My clothing will change them. They will be changed. You are the same. Your years will not come to an end. This is all about how Jehovah God is absolutely unchanging. He's the creator of all things, right? Well, yeah. They're, you're not saying anything that they're going to disagree with at this point. But they're going to be a little surprised if you're using the name Jehovah. Because most Jehovah's Witnesses think we don't know anything about the name Jehovah. They really do. They think they're the only ones who know the name. Okay. So this couldn't, be, this couldn't describe anyone else. I mean, only Jehovah is the creator of all things. Only Jehovah doesn't change, right? Yeah. Okay. Keep your finger there and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Now, this is where you have to, if, if you do this right, I've, I've done it many times. It's extremely powerful. Don't rush it. Okay. Start a few verses back. Start, for example, you, you can start all the way back at verse 6 if you want to. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, the New World Translation won't translate that right. It'll say, let all the angels of God do obeisance to him. They're trying to hide the deity of Christ. Don't even worry about it. Don't even argue about it. This is about Jesus, right? This is about the Son, right? This, yes, this is about the Son. Verse 7, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Now, again, the New World Translation mistranslates that too. Don't worry about it. The point is the connecting phrase at the beginning of verse 8. But of the Son, he says, and then you have a quotation from the Old Testament. Verse 10, and, which continues what? Speaking of the Son, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all become old like a garment, and like a mantle you roll them up like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. And in their own New World Translation, there will be a little footnote next to verse 10. And in the center column, it'll say Psalm 102, 25 through 27. And it gets just as silent as it just did when they read that. Because most of them have been going door to door for years. No one's ever shown them that. And so what you do in that silence is you do not sit back and go, <laughs> gotcha. That's what some people want to do. What you do in that silence is you say, now, if you've never had an opportunity to look at this before, could, could you look into that and get back to me? And could I show you one more? I've never had one say no. They're in shock. They're not used to talking to Christians who A, know their Bible. And, and by the way, you know why I emphasized what I did when I read Psalm 102? Because there are some other places where Jesus identifies Jehovah, but the, the attributes that are identified could also be applied to others. Those words they already agreed in Psalm 102 could only be applied to whom? Jehovah God. Why then does the writer of Hebrews so plainly apply them to Jesus as an unchanging, unchangeable creator, not a creation? That's why you emphasize it up front. Okay? So I say, can I show you one more? And that's what we'll do. We'll do one more, then we'll wrap up. 